This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Nate Blyton. I'm Sam Merciers. And joining, this, joining us this week is a returning friend of the show, Rachel Yoder. She is a uh, clarinetist and new music aficionado and involved in all kinds of other things that I couldn't even begin to uh, remember. So I'm just going to let her tell us all the stuff she's into. How's it going, Rachel? It's going good. Thanks for having me back on. It's been a while. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, so, so uh, currently uh, what I'm doing this year is I'm working as director of communications for the UNT College of Music. And um, as you know, I finished my doctorate there a couple years ago. And then now I'm kind of back in from uh, seeing the college from another point of view. But it is, it's a big job. UNT has usually is right up there with IU for being the highest, having the highest enrollment of any college of music in the country. So it's a really interesting place to work, and uh, there's always a lot to do. <laughs> so, Rachel, I know you've only been doing that job for about a month. Uh-huh. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, you obviously have a doctorate in clarinet performance and not in any kinds of communication thing. Uh-huh. And I, think, I personally think that's perfectly fine and going forward because of technology ha- – Having a person who has that job, having some sort of specialized degree in it is going to become less of a big deal, if that makes sense. So I guess what I'm asking is, do you think um, uh, it's important to understand the population for which you're working more than having a lot of technical knowledge about the field, so to speak? Does that make sense? Or do you mm-hmm. have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, um, to, at some point, you can, you can learn to do just about anything if you try hard enough, I think. Um, So the first week that I worked there, I kind of felt like I was taking journalism 101 and arts marketing, uh, maybe 102, since I sort of have already done some of that. (laughs) But uh, I work closely with university news people at UNT who um, understand more of how to deal with reporters and um, how to work with the media. So they've been teaching me a lot. But I think um, possibly what UNT was looking for in this position is someone who has uh, upper, I mean, they wanted someone who had graduate work in music in addition to writing skills and um, technology skills and all sorts of other things. So it's really kind of an impossible to find person, I think, that has that whole package. So anybody that comes into that kind of job is going to have to do some amount of learning on the job. Uh, but that brings me to an interesting point in that my work in uh, new music I think really actually helped me get be prepared for this type of a job um, more on the administration side of things because I had done an internship with uh, Voices of Change, the new music ensemble in Dallas, and I had worked as the executive director of the Dallas Festival of Modern Music for a year. Um, and so these were all things that gave me experience, not to mention freelancing and trying to promote my own career and uh, get word of my own performance activities out there. So. In the course of doing that, I ended up doing a lot of the type of things that you would do working in communications, um, such as putting out a newsletter, um, using social media to promote events, and um, even doing press releases. All those kinds of things I had some experience with because of my work in new music, actually. That's interesting, because, and I think you're right, that new music in particular, even more than a lot of other kinds of classical music has become much more of a DIY endeavor. And so people yeah. are getting all those experiences in, in um, all, all those different parts uh, that, that go on outside of just playing their instruments or, or in our case, as composers writing dots and lines to writing press releases and, and getting people to show up and, you know, essentially putting on the, the performance yourself, producing the concert and mm-hmm. getting people there to hear it. So that's a really that's a that's an interesting observation. So you think your experience doing those things yourself is helping you now to do those things for UNT on a professional level? Yeah, yeah, that's really very cool. cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems to me that someone who has a degree that's supposed to prepare them to do that kind of thing is probably going to have a greater tendency to treat the new music world like they would, you know, uh, the pop music world. So, like, they think about their classes they took, like, how to run and start a record label, as an example. Uh-huh. 
um, that's not necessarily going to be the same kind of thinking you're going to need in the new music world because the population is different, the stakeholders are different, and they want different things, and the the economy is so much smaller. We're not talking about huge gobs of money. Um, so anyway, I, I think it's really interesting too. Uh, yeah. I'm glad I'm glad you got that job because that's the kind of stuff Dave and I like to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your what's your experience been so far there? Oh, it's been great. Um, I mean, it's it's really different coming back. You know, I've been a student obviously for far too long, and then I was uh, I taught at UNT as a teaching fellow, and then at uh, Southeastern Oklahoma State as a professor. So I've kind of seen both of those sides, and um, I think when I was a professor, I thought, oh, uh, yeah, the faculty is who really has to work hard. And you know, I used to think as a student I worked hard, but as faculty, you really have to work hard. And now that I'm staff. I'm like, no, the staff is really what gets everything done around here. You know, I mean, it's just, it's amazing at a school like UNT, um, how many people are working behind the scenes and um, trying to do all of the work that makes everything happen in the college. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I've been, I've got to uh, meet with people from the Dallas Symphony to help market a concert that they're doing up in Denton uh, next month and been working closely with the dean at UNT and, um, that's been really interesting to uh, be able to work directly with him and try to translate his vision for the College of Music, um, the public face of the College of Music of UNT, and try to translate that out into the world through uh, media, through um, hopefully press coverage on a local or even national or international level. Um, social media, I've been trying to ramp up the social media aspect too. and. Uh, it's just a real varied job. I'm also supposed to do grants as well. So we'll see how I have time to fit all that in, along with editing our calendar, our semester calendar that, of events that comes out and the alumni uh, magazine. So it's a big job. Wow. Yeah. That's like I everything. Busy. Yeah. yeah. I want to put my application in to be your personal assistant, and I'm only going to ask 65 k a year. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds okay. pretty reasonable, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Put your application in. It's not going to go anywhere. But <laughs> um, so uh, we don't want to pass up any of your credentials here. So you had experience uh, writing to help get this job, and part of that would be through the Clarinet Cash blog. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So you guys have seen a lot of action recently because not that long ago, the yearly super duper clarinet extravaganza. What do they call it? Uh, <laughs> clarinet fest. Clarinet fest. Yes, just went down. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, and and not to get too geeky on a single instrument, but how did that go? Since you're heavily involved, yeah. Oh, it was great. It was in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, which didn't sound like it was going to be that much fun, but um, it was actually a really well-run festival. And Lincoln is actually pretty cool. Um, yeah, five days of clarinet activities, and we just tried to, as always, we have we try to tweet about the conference as it's going on and blog about it and do reports and. Um, I think this time, it's interesting because I think now that we, you know, they can kind of come off as just like puff pieces when people write reviews of these types of conferences because you don't want to offend anybody. But I think this time around, because Kelly, Kelly is professor of clarinet at uh, Texas A&M Kingsville, um, and I have this job at UNT, I think partly because we both have jobs now, we're not as concerned about trying to please everyone and, and you know, always be positive and rah-rah about everything. So we've tried to um, include a little more actual music criticism in our coverage of this year's Clarinet Fest. So you can go and read about it if you want. But, yeah, it was great. How, how was the added criticism received? Well, I don't know. Nobody said anything about it. So, um <laughs> People don't comment very much on stuff that we write. I don't know. Maybe no one's reading it, but I think people are, <laughs> people are reading it. I think, I mean, it's, we just, basically we, we wrote in places where we did criticize it was, uh, the, it was places where everyone was already thinking that. Um, and, you know, there were areas of just only a couple things that people were disappointed about, about the festival. So it's only, uh, ethically right for as a journalist as a pseudo journalist to try to uh, convey that to people so so what was the big smash superstar hit of the the festival though there had to be like one piece that everybody was just going crazy over oh boy 
That's a tough question. Um, you know, normally the evening concerts are a little bit of a highlight, um, but this time around that was one of the things. The backing ensembles were a little subpar, and it kind of influenced the performances there. But, you know, my favorite thing was the Ironwood Trio. It's a trio of clarinetists. Uh, they all actually studied with Robert Spring, and it's Ann Watson, Janice Starling, and Leslie Moreau. And uh, so, they, I mean, they're like, I think probably about eight or ten years out of school by now, but it's an E-flat, clarinet, B-flat, and bass trio. And they were playing some new music, one piece written for them, and um, another piece, I'm not sure. but And I can't tell you the composers off the top of my head, but yeah, just super energetic performances and really committed and just amazing playing. They, they were probably my favorite favorite thing out of the whole festival. You say they all three studied with uh, Robert Spring? Right, yeah. Were they all doing some sort of super-duper clarinet gymnastics <laughs> a lot of Robert Spring? You know, I would say they were, they were uh, definitely they had the technique, but they were super expressive. Janice Starling, um, I've heard her play before with Robert Spring, and uh, she's just, you know, a firecracker to watch on stage. She's just so expressive, and um, they just, you know, bring so much vitality to the new music that they play, which is so often missing, I think. And I, I just want to make it clear that I, I don't think that Robert Spring plays unexpressively. Yeah. But for the non-clarinet geeks out there, he's known for, like, he releases an album where he demonstrates the his complete mastery of altissimo and then another album where he demonstrates his complete mastery of double and triple tonguing. He's right. got that kind of stuff really, really, really down in addition to being a great player in all other ways. Thanks for so, clearing great. that up, Sam. That's right. <laughs> Cause I was, I was curious. So one more thing, another thing in your, in your bio, I wanted to cover before we move on because you wrote a, a, a P uh, an essay that's gotten a lot of hits and yeah. uh, a lot of people have commented on, but I wanted to ask because I know your husband, Greg, yeah. um, this Odd Partials Project. I want you to tell us about that. Sure, yeah. Um, so Odd Partials is a clarinet and electronics duo uh, between me and my husband, Greg Dixon. And uh, we're currently working on a program. We've, we've done improvisation and things in the past. Uh, what we're working on right now is a program of all, all uh, interactive scores, interactive music, and including a piece by Greg, a piece by Stephen Lucas, another doctoral composer here for bass clarinet and uh, electronics, which is inspired by Zool music, like of the band Magma, kind of like it's dark mm -hmm. prog rock music. So that's kind of interesting. And uh, a piece by Andrew May, who's the head of SEMI, Center for Experimental Music and Intermedia at UNT. And uh, his piece I actually wrote about in my dissertation, which was about interactive music, but I had only played an excerpt of it. I hadn't gotten to perform the whole thing. So I'm really excited to perform that. And that's written for Jerry Aranti, uh, which is commissioned, quote, commissioned or slash requested, which is something I want to talk with you guys about later, uh, commissioned tons of uh, interactive works and works for clarinet and technology. Uh, there's a piece by Eric Honor. At, uh, who's from UMKC. I don't know if you guys know him, but bass clarinet and electronics, kind of like trip-hop influenced interactive piece, but in a really good way. And then a uh, new piece, which I haven't gotten all of yet, from Kevin Patton, who uh, has was at UNT and then at Brown and uh, now is teaching at Oregon State. So, uh, we're going to be we're going to be performing at the University of Wyoming. They're having a New Frontiers Festival, uh, their which is their new music festival that happens every year at the end of September and we're going to go and sort of be in residence for a couple of days and do classes with uh, I'll do a class on extended techniques and we're going to do a session for the whole the school at their sort of general convocation about uh, collaboration and in interactive music and then do our recital. Awesome. So just to clarify, when you say interactive, like, uh, so the signal's being processed and it, it's doing stuff, it's responding to stuff that you do? Right, yeah. So not, not just clarinet and tape or clarinet with like a pedal type effects, but yeah, that the computer is, is actually responding in some sort of way uh, that's a little bit unpredictable, I suppose, that I can react back. I mean, we could talk about this for a whole hour, but there's sort of different levels of of interactivity 
Um, whereas, you know, you can use Max MSP to create the same effects that you could get with a delay pedal. You can do that, and it's not really interactive, it's just effects. Um, so some pieces that we everybody tends to call interactive because they use Max, um, it's debatable whether they are truly interactive because if the, compose, if the performer has a written out score that they're just following, and they're, they don't really have any room to react to what the computer is doing anyway. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, but a lot of interactive pieces have improvisational elements or you choose your own path through these elements or um, uh, sections that are a little more free to allow for the uh, interaction to actually go both ways. So, um, Are there any sections or, or in any of the pieces is the, is the interaction uh, cued or triggered, I guess I would say, by something other than audio? Because yeah. I know and pieces that involve, you know, motion sensors and what have you. Yeah, I haven't really done a whole lot with uh, motion sensors, but I've done, I've used a pedal. You know, that's one of the aspects of the performance practice of interactive music is how do you trigger the computer to know when it's entered a different section? Because normally the computer does not stay in one state for the whole piece. It's kind of shifting. So um, I've used a pedal. I'm going to use a pedal on a couple of the pieces uh, for this concert. And Greg also will be doing some things in his piece. He actually has a um, element for the laptop performer, in which you can the the person who's controlling the cues can um, control things, reactions by the computer as they happen. So, uh, yeah, that's I think always really interesting when the computer performer gets to interact with the onstage performer. Yeah, it's right. way more fun for the engineer for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it really does make it more of a duo, which is what we want it to be, rather than Greg being an assistant. We want it to really be a collaboration. So. I like that you're making a distinction between kind of the the automated reactive computer things, and then the things, and then the pieces that allow you to kind of collaborate in real time with either either an engineer who's sitting at the at the computer itself or the composer who created this thing beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, that's a distinction that I don't think we've talked about before. And it's, it's kind of a new, new thing in technology. And it's a new thing for me to, to think about. Well, I guess I kind of see it as a spectrum from sure. like on one end being a delay pedal and on the other end being like George Lewis's interactive environments, which is basically just an artificial intelligence that he has cultivated and that you perform with as a performing partner and you never really know for sure what it's going to do. So there's kind of a whole continuum in between those two things. Yeah, that's really interesting to me that that, that is the case, but that's true in how it's perceived. Ultimately, any computer program is just making a series of yes-no decisions, you know, or and it's interesting that the sophistication level can reach a point where it seems like it's not just yes-no decisions, like it's intuiting something. Um, I don't know. That's just a, and that's why humans rule the universe, you know. <laughs> yeah. Nate is on the cusp of wanting to say something the whole time right. because this is his thing. <laughs> and and as Sam says, this is a, a thing that I've done a lot in a, like I have a duo with Jeff Dival. He's out in Kansas. Friend of the days, show. So. Yeah, friend of the show, Jeff Dival. And uh, we do a similar layer of things. I'm a composer and I've been doing things with computer music for a long time and the, those different degrees of interaction. But I've also played that role a lot of uh, being the audio engineer that ends up having to press a lot of buttons in different mm -hmm. pieces or play a keyboard part. And what, like, uh, I feel like as, as you get more interactive in that level, you end up turning into much more of a musician as you're going. So maybe the engineer is the wrong word some, in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, at some point, it gets complicated enough that you have to practice it, right? Oh, and, right. And, and then it becomes your musician playing the laptop as opposed to a person just making it go, right? And, yeah. And I think those times when you have to practice, those are the, those are the good pieces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, There's a, oh, so I, I, and it's great to hear you talk about this. I don't know if we have talked about this before, and I'm, I'm interested to hear about... Uh, your, your dissertation and your research in, in that way, too. Um, and as I was going around your website, I noticed that you've got it posted to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Or? 
Sure, yeah. The My dissertation, it's posted online at my website, racheljoderclarinet.com. So you can read more there, a lot more if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, one of the things in reaction to what, what you just said um, that I discussed in the dissertation is I, I uh, did struggle with what to call that, that role in interactive music. And I ended up calling it, rather than sound engineer or anything like that, I ended up calling it technical assistant. Uh, but I don't know if I'm still quite happy with that. It kind of depends on the repertoire that you're performing. But the way I look at it is um, just just how a performer of traditional works would tour with a pianist to accompany them, who's every bit as musically trained as they are, but sort of in a, a little bit of a supplementary role or a little bit of a accompanying role in some cases. Uh, performers nowadays are forming duos and they're forming partnerships and they're touring together and uh, doing all these types of things even though it's not a pianist they're touring with it's a computer technician and musician computer musician I think a helpful hint to composers who are trying to get their stuff performed is uh, pieces where you don't need the technician like whatever the computer part is it's stable enough that you can trust it to just do its thing and yeah. that may be the lower end of the interactivity but you know, a performer who's trying to get tenure or whatever <laughs> is going to try and perform all the time. And if you give them a 13 minute piece that doesn't require a piano player, so they don't have to hire anybody when they travel around mm -hmm. to perform, and they can count on the computer not crashing when they try to perform it, it is a good yeah. way to get yeah. performances. And I'm speaking from experience. Yeah, consistency is a big deal. I don't know if we talked about it on this show, but I know Tim and I talked about it on Music is Hard a couple of months ago. Um, Dead Mouse had a blog post called we all press play basically and he was saying that he doesn't really control very much in the performance he's, he has very little control he's, he's an electronic dance musician he has once they get to the show he doesn't actually control very much he pretty much just presses play to start the thing and maybe something else to stop it um and the reason for that is that it needs to work every time it can't break down in the middle of of the the performance and so he strips out all the things that might go wrong. And the more things he strips out, the simpler his job is at the, at the performance. And so the, I think, yeah. Sam, you're, you're, you're absolutely right in saying that the closer you get to the delay pedal end of Rachel's spectrum, the more dependable the technology is. And the closer mm -hmm. you get to the, the kind of really, truly interactive um, kind of quasi intelligent computer program, the uh, the more you have to you know sacrifice a goat to the gods of computer music and hope that everything works out in the end. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, I have a good story about that Ooh, uh, related it. to my dis relating to my dissertation. It's not a story from me, but um, it's a story from a piece by Court Lippy. And uh, so Court Lippy wrote a piece in 1992 called Music for Clarinet and ISPW. And that was working on the ISPW, running on the next computer, you know, this setup that cost like $30,000 basically to do at that, to, to use at that time in 1992. And that was, the piece was written for Esther Lamnick. So the big thing that he was exploring with that, together with Miller Pocket, they were basically developing the software to do that, was score following. And he wrote several papers about it. He presented about it that year about score following and how he, um, you know, worked out this algorithm and for computer listening and listening to the pitches that would help it follow along the score, right? So now when you get today's version of the patch, there's a note in it that says uh, you can use this button to turn on the score following, but I highly recommend that you do not use score following. <laughs> and so I'm like, what's going on? So I started emailing Court Lippy about it when I was working for my dissertation and uh, asking him about it. And his, what he said was basically the musical result wasn't worth it. it. Even though he had it up to like 98, 99% reliability, that 1% or 2% where things can go wrong just still was not worth it to have the computer actually doing it when the result sounds the same. Just right. uh, by having it run it itself and be triggered cues uh, by cues, you know, from someone pressing a, a key on the computer keyboard. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, don't fetishize the use of the computer. Make good use of the computer. Right. Um, you know, all of us, anyone here hasn't, uh, ha, ha, has anyone here not been at a concert where you had to wait for a computer to restart when the piece <laughs> was supposed to start and it didn't work and then a bunch of people hunker around the laptop and then before you know it, you hear Windows startup noise and you're going, oh God, this is going to take yeah. a Mac. I, <laughs> I I'm willing yeah, to, it's going to be a Mac startup noise. <laughs> I'm willing to. I'm willing to risk having to put up with that in the interest of art. You know, I think for, for real art music, you have to take that risk. Now, you want to try and make it as dependable as possible. But, so anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's cool to hear. It's cool to hear about it. I'd like, I'd love to read more about it, too. And uh, also, we got a question in the chat room, and I was wondering about this, too. You mentioned stuff about Clarinet Fest and your writing about it and everything. And the I. Uh, it seems like you do all these <laughs> so many layers of things, but where where could people find your uh, like your writings about Clarinet Fest? Yeah, that's on uh, the Clarinet Cash website, and that's at clarinetcash c a c h e dot com. And uh, we also we write a quarterly column that appears in the Clarinet Magazine, which is actually what the blog came out of as the counterpoint. So we write a column about clarinet resources and uh, technologies online. So, okay. uh, yeah, so all of our print columns appear on our blog as well, complete with links and everything like that. Excellent. And uh, at, on your website, I noticed you have, you have a couple performances coming up. You do all this writing, and <laughs> you, you're doing these uh, workshops and everything, and you got this new job that sounds really crazy. Yeah. In terms of you're making us look bad, Rachel. Cut, that, <laughs> cut it out. Well, it is a struggle. I mean, I started the job about a month ago, and... Um, it's been hard to balance the uh, practicing and rehearsing and performing, and it all hasn't quite ramped up yet for the fall. So, <clears throat> yeah, definitely going to have to re-engineer my uh, time commitments and in the interest of my own personal and mental health, I think. <laughs> but I just I enjoy a variety of things, and um, I just I've always been someone who's had a, a whole variety of interests that I enjoy pursuing, and I just have a lot of fun with all these things that I do, so it doesn't always feel like work, I guess. I think it's great. Layers of things, and they, I'm sure they help inform each other, too. You make yeah. a better job, and we, your job will make you a better performer and everything. All these things. Definitely. Um, yeah, so uh, I see you've got some performances coming up later in September, too. Are you interested mm -hmm. in talking yeah, about Yeah, well, there's the Wyoming thing. Um, I don't want to make this the whole, like, the Rachel Yoder show or anything, but... <laughs> Yeah, it's we the should probably move on at some point. But there's the uh, there's the performance in Laramie in Wyoming with Odd Partials, and then uh, I've also been performing here and there with a series uh, called Sounds Modern, and that's it's a series of uh, new music concerts at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth, which is a really incredible museum. And Elizabeth McNutt, who teaches uh, new music essentially at the University of North Texas is the curator of that series. And so sometimes I get asked to play with ensembles. Last year we did uh, Shevsky's Coming Together and Attica uh, together with uh, several performers from UNT. And we had Matt Albert, who's teaching at SMU now, and who recorded that piece with them, uh, with 8th Blackbird, uh, I mean to say. He recorded the vocal part. And I don't know if you know the piece, but it's got a very intense vocal part. And uh, so we got to perform that with him, and that was really special. I was a little bit starstruck, you know, getting to perform with a member, former member of 8th Blackbird. Uh, so what we're doing this time is uh, uh, music by British composers to go along with an exhibit they have uh, currently. And it's Fennessy, uh, Davies, and Burt Whistle. So. So, in addition to all that, you also play in a woodwind quintet. Yeah, <laughs> and you guys had a uh, a, uh, a call for scores recently, and I think that call for scores uh, probably led maybe a little to this newest essay that you've written called "The Problem with Premier Hunting." So, why don't you tell us first about the the quintet and the commissioning project, and then we'll talk about the, what apparently is a pretty hot essay since you've already had seventeen. Uh, comments, including one by a friend of the show, Matt Shandorf. Yeah, yeah, I, I've been uh, I've been surprised. I guess how many people have been sharing it and been interested in it. It's great. 
But uh, yeah, it definitely did come out partially from the the call for scores that we had with the wind quintet. So um, I think I might have talked about this a little bit last year when I was on. Uh, maybe the call was just getting put out or something like that. But yeah, we had a call for scores. We just wanted to find some new repertoire for uh, our quintet. We played through a lot of the standard stuff and uh, done a couple collaborations and uh, people and, and sort of commissions. Uh, still, get, that word always keeps popping back up. But uh, <laughs> the group was interested in doing more new music, which uh, I thought was really cool. So we did the call for scores. We debated limiting it to works that hadn't been performed before, which, as we know, is a common thing. Uh, people have a call, they say it can't have been performed or recorded before because they want to be the first ones to play it. And we ended up deciding, no, let's not. Let's just leave it open because we don't know what we're going to get. Um, we don't know how many people know about us anyways, and uh, let's just see what happens. So we got 130-plus submissions, which was way more than we expected. Uh, so it took us forever to go through them all, but... Um, we ended up with five pieces that I think are really cool. They're really great pieces. And you can read more about the whole project. You can watch our Kickstarter video for that, what we did for that. Uh, but I just found myself thinking, like, as we were listening to these pieces, the ones that hadn't been performed before were overall, like, not very impressive. You know, I mean, they, they just... They sounded like things that had been written at a computer in some cases. You know, some people call it finale music. It just it sounds like it wasn't written with the actual instruments in mind. Um, and right. it's, General MIDI performs it. Yeah, I know. Uh, but the wind quintet especially has such a variety of colors and timbres going on that if you're ignoring that and you're only thinking about pitches, uh, it just doesn't make for a good piece. And we can, as experienced wind quintet performers, we can tell that when composers aren't thinking about that, about the actual sounds that the instruments are making. Um, so, yeah, I, I just found myself thinking about, well, why are these pieces not so great? Well, maybe because they've been sitting around for 10 or 15 years and nobody else had wanted to play them in that meantime. So why would, we, you know, there might, maybe there's something that could be improved on that piece, you know? Um, and I also found myself thinking about how the pieces were written, that if the composer was sitting there writing the piece without an ensemble in mind uh, to perform it and not talking or, you know, trying things out with a group, that uh, that definitely has an impact on the quality of the piece as well. And the level of professional, it shows the level of professionalism of the composer a little bit, I think, as well. Well, Woodwind Quintet, I would say, is not one of the easier ensembles to write for. Um, no. <laughs> I haven't tried it. I've considered it a lot, and my conclusion that it's not easy to write for is why I haven't written a piece, I guess. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of going to plunge into the middle of the piece. I mean, you go through a lot of different things I'm sure we'll get to, but one thing that uh, a lot of people commented on was the whole idea of commissioning and what yeah. does that word actually mean. And if somebody doesn't get paid, does that still mean that they were commissioned to do something? And if not, does it... Uh, lead to uh, Vita inflation, I think, was something like that that somebody used as a, a, a comment. So um, I have thoughts about it, but I want to hear what, uh, first, what you think. Like, does yeah. it have to be paid for, for it to be called a commission? Well, you know, I mean, I'm all for composers getting paid. My husband is one, so uh, I, and I like to try to get composers paid whenever possible, but the what I said in the essay is that uh, I said, these days you can call it a commission even if no money changes hands. The reason I said that is because I know for a fact that people do it. And if other people do it, then we all have to do it. Because otherwise it makes it sound less impressive when you say, this piece was written for me, or I requested this piece. If you call it a commission, it gives it like an air of prestige to it. Now, that might be totally incorrect, but that's just my impression is that People, people just do it these days. People call things commissions when they're not, no money is changing hands, but a lot of time is uh, going into both sides of the collaboration. And I think both sides, in a good collaboration, both sides are getting something. So something is being exchanged, just not money. Right. 
So I think I'm the sure. CV inflation, though, is is a, is a big problem because you see a lot of these like 18 year old kids that wrote stuff for their friends and they call those things commissions. And then they have like 14 commissions on their CV when they're applying for their bachelor's degrees. And that's really <laughs> confusing to look at because right. it's not really the same thing. <clears throat> that's true. But it doesn't really bother me because, you know, a bunch of premieres by the. The, you know, you got 11 premieres, but they're all by people you've never heard of. And if they have a website, you look it up and it's an undergraduate, you know, brass quintet. Yeah, but but how, how many how many badass musicians exist in the world that you've never heard of? A lot. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> right. But as far as a commission giving you any real grist for your Vita mill, sure, it's sure. got to be the higher profile the ensemble is, the higher profile the commission is. So I have no problem calling it a commission. I don't think it, it makes a difference one way or the other. I mean, I, I, I've had this before the other way. I wrote a piece for a chamber ensemble that I'm close friends with. And um, it was just a thing where, you know, I said, we were having beers one night and they said, Hey, we should, we should work on a project together. And so I wrote them this piece and it was great. And then I was reading some press about this group later and, and it, they listed among the, the composers that they've premiered me or that they've commissioned rather me. And I thought to myself, huh, I never really thought of that as a commission, but now I'll have to put that as a commission on my CV. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, it, it, like like Rachel said in your piece, it, it looks good not just for composers to say, hey, I've had this piece premiered, but for performers to say, hey, I've premiered these pieces. Yeah, it's true. And you got to do what you can to make it look good. You know, when like you're talking to a guy who has I've had a piece played in Slovenia once and a piece played in Puerto Rico and then all over the United States and one in Canada. So I'm able to say in my bio, Sam Mercier's music has been performed throughout the Americas and in Europe. You know, <laughs> that sounds a lot better than once in Puerto Rico and once in, in Slovenia, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, everybody, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta oil the wheel any way you can to, to try and make yourself look good. I, I, I will say regarding those, those, uh, calls for scores, Rachel, that you mentioned where they ask specifically for works that have not been played before. I just lie. I just, this isn't, well, how are they going to find out? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If you're if you're a low rung schmuck composer like me, how are they ever gonna find out? <laughs> like, are they gonna are they gonna look through all of the programs of every chamber ensemble in the United States to find this one that has this piece on it? Of course. Well, not. there is this thing called Google, so sometimes things show up on there. That's right. Surprise. Well, <laughs> if you become famous, then it'll come when you run for president of composing. Um, it'll come back. <laughs> it'll be used against you. Sure. Or, or just <laughs> interpret those uh, never been performed it's before. It's like it hasn't had it. It's, it's, a, it's a preview. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's right. <laughs> well, and the other thing is, how many of you have had pieces performed where it was so abysmal? You're like, no, uh, it doesn't like, count. <laughs> really, at best, you could say it was sixty percent premiered because that's about. <laughs> <laughs> It's rough out there for a composer. Way, uh, way more interesting to me than the kerfuffle over whether or not to call it commissioning is, the, the, to me, the coolest point in here is uh, not to undervalue the second performance. To me, that's something that more people should do. Um, and like you make the point you make in the, the piece is that you, if you don't limit it to new brand new pieces and you're searching through pieces that have already had other performances, you're likely to get better material because I don't think there's a composer on the panel right now who after hearing a piece premiered didn't at least think I should make this and that and that change and probably has made changes <coughs> after the first premiere. I don't know that I've not made changes to any piece that's been premiered, you know, because you find stuff that just doesn't work. Just mm -hmm. doesn't how much you try and convince the performers that if they could just do it the way you had it in your head, it would sound right. You know, sometimes it just doesn't translate and you have to change it. So you end up with a better product. And I think you're seeing now a proliferation of ensembles that are committing in their calls for scores or their composition contests or whatever, however they're wording it. You're seeing a lot more ensembles that are committing to two, three, four or more performances. They say, you know, the selected work will be a part of our 2013-2014 season or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, rather than we're going to play it at this concert in October. So, uh, yeah. and, and that's, I think that's more interesting to me. That's certainly, again, 
more is as Sam was saying, you're going to get more people that are that are interested in submitting to this, and then hopefully you'll have a better work as a result. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um. I think this, new music requires often requires more rehearsal time than traditional music, anyways. So if you're going to uh, take the time to put together some piece that's fairly complex and is going to take some time and uh, you're spending a lot of hours rehearsing that, you might as well try to get some mileage out of that. As, as a performer, it doesn't really serve you that well just to play a piece one time. So with, this con with our concert with Madero Wind Quintet last spring, we performed it three times in its entirety and um, it only got better every time. And then we recorded the CD uh, we actually did our last performance after recording the CD, which was really fun because we had the time to go in and fix all those little things that you always that always bother you, and then do a full performance after that. But yeah, I, th I think it's it's really important to program more than one performance of uh, new music, anyways, aside from the premiere, even if you're the one premiering it. Yeah, and I think I think that's maybe even a failure of the way that we we teach music and new music in, in particular, but music in general in colleges is that, you know, you spend the semester working on this program and then you give the performance at the end of the semester and you get your grade on that performance and then you start working on the next thing for the next semester. Um, mm -hmm. There's never a point at which it's, it's built into the curriculum to give several performances. And it's tricky because a lot of colleges are in places where there aren't a lot of opportunities to perform um, you're, you're not, it's going to have, have a hard time finding an audience for that fourth or fifth performance. Um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's certainly valuable to have that experience and to understand that. The, I, mean, I mean, if you go to any professional ensemble, any touring chamber ensemble is playing the same program for a year or more at a time, even at the level of an orchestra and they're, they're not spending tons of time in rehearsal, but mm -hmm. the, they're at least going to play it Thursday night, fr Friday night, Saturday, and maybe twice on Sunday, and then they yeah. start the next cycle. Um, so. I think it would be like the best class to have a touring class. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that would be that a fantastic be class for a semester yeah. in college. You spend two <laughs> months working on your program, and then you're on the road for two weeks or something. Yeah, And you have to plan the tour and book it and all yeah. that stuff. <laughs> Fantastic idea. <laughs> we just changed education right here on Sound Notion. Everybody write that down. I mean, I've never done that when I had to, you know, perform classical music, but I've done lots of shows where you're traveling all day in a van or cramped in your car with all your crap, and you get there, and then sometimes it's set up and wait for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, and then sometimes it's like, you got 45 minutes, go. And so you don't get to get in your special art space or anything. It's like you get your crap set up, and then it's go. You know, and, then, and then you and say you on your CV <laughs> that you were on a multi-state tour. There you go. With, and it's actually <laughs> something that, um, uh, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? Name David, Co David Culver. 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 Yeah. The uh, uh, savvy musician. Yeah, savvy musician. Anyway, anyway, anyway. he write. Whoa, we're getting some nasty Man. feedback from you, Sam. Rachel, yeah. do you have? Are you, you're not listening to headphones, correct? Right. Right. And is there an air conditioner or anything that's kicking on in your house right now? Um, uh, yeah, actually, yeah. It, it, there was there one. Was that came on. I'm getting a feedback from both from Sam, Sam and Rachel. Rachel. Oh, that's oh, just the delay pedal that, that, that I had you guys running through. through. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go turn that on. Are you getting feedback from me, Dave? Yes, yeah. a lot. Yeah, a lot. Sam, you're the only one that's not feeding back. So I think it's coming from you. Sorry, everybody. This happens sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it was working fine for a, a while. Oh, and Rachel, you sound good now too. Okay. So yeah, it's probably I think, good. I think we've solved we've 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 solved that problem. Yeah, okay. good work, Sam. I had my microphone <laughs> muted that whole time. So now is it still doing it? I'm sitting uh, closer uh, to my mic than I normally do, so I just turned down. My you're really mic. soft now. Yeah, I yeah. think the feedback's fixed, and yeah, yeah, I think we can go on. All right. So now that we now that we spent the almost an hour talking <laughs> talking about R Rachel's stuff, <laughs> yeah, Sam, please move on. Max speed. Speaking of premieres, this German composer finally got his big break. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. 
Yeah, is Carline Stockhausen? Something like that. I don't know if I don't know if we're saying that right. <laughs> yeah, I, I know I'm not going to say the name of the piece right. So, Dave, go take it away. I don't know if I'm saying it right either, but I'm going to call it Mittwoch aus Licht, uh, which I believe means Wednesday from or of light or something like that. Nate, Nate's our right. German scholar. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, Licht is the opera, right? That's the the whole thing. Uh, the whole, uh, yeah, the whole thing is leaked. Yeah. No, I think Midvak out leaked is the whole title. No, but I mean, he has uh, the opera contains multiple days. The idea it was going to be a uh, what's twenty four times seven, like a seven day opera, right? Oh yeah, this is this is uh, this is um, the six hour thing. It includes the helicopter quartet, yeah, which we'll we'll have a video of later in the show. Um, but it, it got its premiere. It was written in the early to mid '90s, and hasn't been premiered until just now, uh, in its entirety by Bir Birmingham Opera in the UK. And uh, there's a bunch of reviews out. They all seem very positive. Everybody was was happy to to attend the premiere of this crazy Stockhausen work. Um, and we've got a link to Timothy Rutherford Johnson as a freelance critic in the UK. Uh, who has kind of assembled the best snippets of a bunch of different reviews. So if you need a quick rundown of what everybody thought of the opera performances last week, you should check it out. We'll have a link in our show notes. Um, and if you're watching live, Nate just put a link in, uh, in, in the chat room. So thank you, Nate. I'm going to keep doing that. <laughs> it's good. It's helpful. The good. consensus... Good among the people who mention it in the in the sort of excerpts that you get in this blog post is that they thought it was good but they thought they were not fans of the helicopters either for financial sonic or both reasons or or environmental reasons perhaps yeah <laughs> yeah in my my position from the very beginning this was that it's a little i mean everybody knows Stockhausen had a huge ego but even for him, employing four helicopters is over the top. That's we don't need to be wasting that much money on something like that. It is a little <laughs> silly, and in fact, the impossibility of it is I'm pr I, I would have sworn until you pointed out to me that it's not mentioned that that's what Frank O'Terry is talking about in his piece this week on New Music Box uh, about impossible music. I just assumed that he was writing about Stockhausen. And the helicopter quartet in particular, but Midvok in general. Um, so, Sam, tell us tell us about impossible music. Um, well, future friend of the show, Frank J. O'Terry, because we're going to get time. Um, is basically talking about writing a piece um, that at one point he thought was impossible to play. Um, and it sits and uh, languishes for quite a long time until he has a friend who takes up what he calls the Herculean challenge of trying to make the piece into music somehow. And uh, he ended up having to change things and do this and that and the other to make it work. Um, but it's just sort of a, a, a contemplation on the idea of writing music that is or at least seems unplayable. And the big distinction that he draws, in, in my view, what I took from it, is that there's a big difference between writing music that is unplayable and writing music that is supposed to yield noises that are a, a, a result of the conflict between the unplayability and the music, musicians' struggle to make it playable. Like, the example is always, Fernie House music is always used as an example. You can't really like his i can't remember the, but the bass clarinet piece is the one i've looked at the score a lot it's a bass clarinet solo piece time and motion study too yeah you can't i mean if you plug that all into finale and had finale regurgitate it, it perfectly no performance you ever hear of that is going to sound this way but it's about the grist between like trying to make it happen and what dr abriel would have for my undergrad would have called the bravura of watching the the compo the performer struggle with it you know that is not what he's talking about. He's talking about how it's something that evades the ability to be performed, um, not just from those kinds of technical ways, but just, you know, it, it just evades uh, accurate performance when accurate performance is what you're after. Does that make sense? Sure. sure. 
And and he says that's a different thing. He's <laughs> Oteri talks uh, mentions Fernyhow not by name in in the first paragraph. And he says that's a, that's not what I'm talking about. But yeah, um, the the idea that something could seem impossible today, but 20 years from now is you know standard rep almost something like uh, Verez's ionization that he mentions in here is pretty much standard rep for percussion ensembles. But at the time it was written, it was pretty much impossible. So um, things like that change what, what we deem impossible, where that line is between something that's just really, really hard and something that's actually impossible is moving, and it's moving towards impossible all the time. Yeah. Yeah, and as a performer, I would just say that um, I do try to not... I, I, I like it in a, way, in a way when a composer says... Oh well, what do you specialize? Like, what are your special techniques? Like, what's your bag of tricks, so to speak? And they want you to even sometimes send them a recording in new music. Um, are you guys hearing that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's Sam. Oh, okay. Damn it. Sam, <laughs> I, I'm not convinced that you've ever actually solved the the feedback problem. We can talk yeah. about it later. Okay. Anyways. But uh, a lot of times composers will be like, well, what can you do that's really interesting with extended techniques and uh, send me a recording or what's your bag of tricks? And um, I'll, I will do that sometimes, but I don't want to be, ever be limited by what I can already do because then you get into a rut. And uh, sometimes, uh, countless times, I've gotten a piece and I've just thought, like, there's no way that I can do that. I can't make that sound or I can't do that technique that they're after. But then if you sit there and kind of bang your head against the wall a little bit with it, you can find a way through it and you, you can find a way to do it. And um, I just think it's important to not ever look at a piece and say that, I, that that's impossible, that I can't do that because you can surprise yourself with the things that you can do. Yeah. I have a friend of mine is a pianist, and he he always, he likes to tell the story of working on I think I think it's a Ravel piece. It involves some really really fast articulations on one particular key, and so like playing really repeated fast really fast repeated notes on the same pitch, and he couldn't. There's a particular technique, and he couldn't do it. And he was sitting there all day long, blah, 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 for like hours and hours, just trying to play this one repeated note thing, and he was almost like falling asleep. Kind of has his head down on the side of the piano, and, blah, 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 and he realizes eventually, as he was about to fall asleep, that he was doing it. And he's like, "Oh my god, I'm doing it! I'm doing it!" <laughs> and he, he didn't want to stop because he didn't think he'd be able to figure out how to do it again. But eventually, he figured out how to do it, and it's like one of his favorite things to demonstrate to people is how he can do this crazy thing. I don't, even, I don't know what it's called, but if you're a pianist, correct me. Um, so, it looks like this, though. though. It looks like this. This is what it looks like. <laughs> Uh, and I'm pretty sure it was in a Ravel piece that he had to do that for. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> Sam, you you had a you had a, a a segue here that I don't want to take from you. I can't hear you at all, so I, I clearly am going to have to take the segue away from you. Um, <laughs> doc chat to punt on that. Say what? I just put in the doc chat to punt on the next. Oh, okay. Well, we've got some some quick. Quick stories to mention really, really briefly uh, for, for you to check out. The Scottish Sun uh, had a, an interesting, somewhat controversial interview with violinist Nicola Benedetti this week. Uh, she's a Scottish violinist, um, though clearly not of Scottish descent with the name Nicola Benedetti. Um, and she uh, is, a, is a very beautiful woman and she plays the violin very well and the entire interview seemed to be focused on the fact that she's a very beautiful woman. Um, and the interviewer is making remarks apparently during the interview, but also writing remarks in the written review about how attractive this person is and how lucky her boyfriend is. And it's really kind of creepy. Um, and so there was a, a lot of, all the comments on this are directed at the interviewer saying you're a horrible, horrible person and you're a pig and I'm never reading this newspaper again and lots of other outlets around uh, the classical music uh, critical whatever in the UK were 
ripping on the Scottish Sun interviewer about this interview. It's it's pretty interesting. So you should check this this interview out uh, and then read the comments. <laughs> we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Um, Commenter Sophie Nocturnal is the best. Her comment is, uh, you shouldn't have the privilege to interview women. Um, you're a <laughs> pit. <laughs> yeah, so you too can read this article and see and and be disgusted yeah right exactly <laughs> see this i was thinking about this piece when i said earlier that it, you're not doing yourself any favor if you think of classical or new music in terms of pop music and that's what this guy he's interviewing her like she's he's talking about her as if she's some pop diva and you know at least half of the package she's supposed to bring is her looks you know Oh, well, you know, even in pop music, it's a problem. I mean, even in rock music, I mean, there's people writing about female musicians in a completely different way that they would write about male musicians in every genre. There's people doing that. I think it was, I'm trying to remember who it was. It might have been Jessica Duchenne. There's a, there's a blogger that I read. It's either, oh, it was either Jessica Duchenne's classical music blog or it was Iron Tongue and Midnight. One of these two blogs, both both of them are by women, and they're both in my Google Reader feed. Um, wrote like a fake article about a fake tenor who like kind of turning this around gender wise and wondering what the reaction would be if oh. she had interviewed a man and uh, written this in this style. So you should, we'll, we'll have to link to that too. I'll that's, have to dig that a, up. Yeah, it's a good article. <laughs> um, so Sam, you know the art of fugue, right? Yes. You know it from memory, right? I, I remember the name of the piece from memory. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Taka Kagawa, a pianist uh, performing at Le Poisson Rouge. First of all, interesting that the art of fugue is at LPR. Um, but is playing it from memory, the whole thing. I don't know how long it is, but it's really it's got to be like an hour, right? It's an hour and a half, and it's says. and it's really intricate. This is not <laughs> this is not an hour and a half of pop tunes. Um, no break, no break, no break. and you know I've been on stage playing uh, like big contrapuntal pieces where I'm playing clarinet and I'm reading the music. And if the piece is long, it's if you lose concentration for a second, you lose yourself in all this complicated counterpoint. And he's playing it from memory. I don't know how you don't get jumbled up because with Bob, I mean, you're going to be playing a lot of stuff that sounds really similar too. You know, the little figurations and stuff are going to a lot of stuff that sounds a lot the same. And it just seems like it would be way too easy to lose it. So impressive. Certainly. I don't know that it was a standing room only crowd too. So I don't know the people that got there late realized they were going to have to stand there for an hour and a half watching this guy go for it. But congratulations to him. I don't think I would, I would want to necessarily sit and listen to the whole thing. Is it time for the pick of the week, Sam? <laughs> do we need a pick of the week? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's funny you mentioned that, Rachel, because he actually does have a delay pedal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, I actually have considered putting my loop station in into the loop. That oh, dear. Just, that was just a, a Yamaha mixer's on board, the, the most intense reverb setting it has. Sure. Cranked to, to 11. Yow. Indeed. So our pick of the week this week is a video of some of the Stockhausen performance this week in Birmingham. Um, there is video on the Guardian's website of just the helicopter quartet portion of, of the performance. It's a, it's a new video, and um, obviously this is something that has, has been available before in video, this piece. Um, but it's a really interesting look at it. I think the, the most recent videos of the helicopter quartet I've seen look pretty dated by now. Um, and you, it's, it's narrated by, um, kind of a, a moderator, which is a, a role that Stockhausen did envision as being part of the performance. Um, and it's a, it's just a really interesting thing. It's, it's about an hour long video. It's on the guardians website. We'll check out just a, a little bit of it. Um, it starts off with the four musicians sitting in front of the audience in the same room as the audience. Um, and the moderator kind of introducing them and then 
the they get they leave the stage and there's a camera that follows them and there's a live feed following them that's projected in the hall for the audience to see and they get in a little van and the van takes them to where the helicopters are and they get in the helicopters and take off so here's a a little bit of uh stockhausen's helicopter string quartet from mid fuck house leaked here we go ladies and gentlemen it begins We're not going to watch this whole thing. You can see this is um, a, a full video. It's very well produced. Thank you to The Guardian for presenting that to us. And if you haven't seen the helicopter string quartet before, you should absolutely check it out. Um, it's it, it's one of the things that, as Sam mentioned, not all of the people writing reviews of this performance were as enthralled with as other parts of the performance. There were certainly uh, plenty of interesting things to see in the performance. There are um, a lot more visual things that are more immediate. This is a, a photograph from uh, one of the performances of these musicians kind of suspended on chairs that are hanging from uh, the ceiling of the space. Um so I, I, I can imagine that the video of the helicopters feels a little bit less immediate, even though you know this is happening just a little bit away. Uh, and you might be able to hear the helicopters acoustically from, from the hall, maybe not. Um, but it, it seems like this kind of musician suspended in, in the hall would, would feel a lot more immediate than the video piped in of the helicopter quartet. That's just me. Well, if anyone had any doubts that Stockhausen was a self-indulgent egomaniac, the evidence is in. I have great respect for him as a composer. He was a great composer, but that doesn't preclude somebody being a self-absorbed egomaniac. Good God. Well, you know, it's the performance art aspect of it. It's the, I mean, he, didn't Stockhausen call the events of 9-11 the greatest uh, work of performance art ever created? You guys yes. remember that? Yeah, and he, it, yeah, that was a pretty memorable thing, I think. For and and he took a lot of heat for that, but you know that's that's how he seems to think of any large attention-getting event as a work of performance art. He said, in reference to the spectacle of the event, that no composer could ever compete with it, or something like that. <clears throat> yeah. So like, anyway, <laughs> it's kind of like saying that. This music thing is never going to be as important as real life crazy or terrible things happening. That's, that's I think that's reasonable. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, anyway, hey, 
we skipped one thing that I want to cover real quick. Oh, okay. Um, rest in peace, uh, Chris Lightly, who was a hip hop manager, producer, you know, business mogul. He is the reason why uh, hip hop is the vocabulary of youth, you know, these days. Um, people don't realize it, but not that long ago, hip hop was not considered safe for, uh, you know, use in mainstream advertisement to sell jeans and burgers and what have you. And this guy is one of the key figures in changing all that. And you can't deny that in changing all that, he changed the musical landscape in the United States and probably the whole world by taking something that was sort of an outsider thing and making it the very, very, very middle of the mainstream. And you can think what you want about that for good or bad, but he was certainly uh, partially responsible for it. And so if you were ever wondering what the intersection of hip hop and the helicopter string quartet was, it's sound notion. Sound notion. <laughs> <laughs> right funny. here. That's a sound notion up. exclusive. We should we should wrap up. Thank you, Rachel, so much for joining us today. It's been been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for having me. Uh, you can find out about all of the things that we talked about in Rachel's uh, internet world. Uh, we'll have links to all of those things on our show notes. You'll find those at soundnotion.tv slash sn. Do you have any um, up, upcoming events that you want to plug real quick before we go? Um, and yeah, you guys should all come to Laramie, Wyoming to hear I'm Greg there. and I perform so at, there. at their festival. <laughs> now, well, the, the CD, the um, Madera Wind Quintet CD is going to be coming out in uh, November. So look Great. for that. Great. I spell the pick of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Book it. Um, that's going to do it for the show this week. Again, to, to read about any of the topics that we've covered, any of these stories, and of course all of Rachel's cool things on the web, uh, you can find those on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN. If you have any comments on the show, you can also leave us a note. We want to especially thank the people who are watching and listening live in the chat room. Thank you guys so much. It's been great to uh, read your feedback live as we're doing the show. Um, if you want to do that, of course, we stream this show live every Sunday morning around 11 a.m. If there's ever a change to that, we'll let you know. This 11 a.m. Eastern time um, yeah. should be clear. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. We're at Sound Notion on Twitter. This show and all our shows are available in the iTunes store, so be sure to go there, subscribe for free, catch every episode, download it automatically to your device. Um, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you back next week. Paul Ryan is a liar. <laughs>